Welcome to Adeptus On Air, the show where we examine how individuals and companies make decisions that drive their business and personal success. Each week, we connect with notable professionals who pull back the curtain on the industries that Adeptus has been on the cutting edge of for the last 30 years, including music, sports, and entertainment, as well as new emerging markets. Welcome to the latest edition of Adeptus on Air, and today we have another great guest in Andrew Heath, who played professional basketball and also uh, has coached on many different levels. So, Andrew, thank thank you for joining us. Um, if if you can just uh, just share your basketball journey a bit, um, playing and coaching, and kind of tell us a little bit about the origin story from the beginning of how you got involved in the sport. Yeah, uh, well, appreciate you having me on. I'm glad we we can uh, make this time work. Um, yeah, I guess going back from the beginning, uh, originally from the East Coast, uh, born and raised in Stanford, Connecticut, uh, played high school ball, went on to uh, be a two-sport athlete in college at Emmanuel College. I played ball and ran track. Um, and then I think kind of the typical uh, figuring out what I wanted to do after like college experience that everyone goes through. Uh, my college coach was in my ear that like, oh, you know, you're, you're, you're good enough to play overseas, so why don't you try that out? So I went to a few tryouts. Nothing actually, uh, unfortunately, at the time came my way. Um, so I got into coaching, AAU, individual training stuff, uh, went back and got my master's. And then I was like, you know what, let me figure out uh, what else I need to do career wise. So I took an opportunity to actually go to China to um, coach over there. Uh, so I was over there coaching for the NBA Academy, uh, was coaching for one of Yao Ming's uh, Academy. So he was actually my boss nice. while I was out there. Wow. Um, and then uh, just happenstance. So originally went to China just to coach. I was playing in some like pickup leagues and some pro-am leagues. Um, and a few guys were like, oh, like you could, you know, make some money playing ball and hooping. Uh, so I kind of found my way into some professional leagues out out in China and did that during my time out there too, playing for a team called the Beijing Panthers. Um, so no, yeah, it was amazing experience. Came back from China uh, currently now live in San Francisco uh, with my wife and our seventh month old son. Um, and I'm nice. the head boys basketball coach at Drew School. So that's the, I'm not wearing this hat because it's my name. Um, <laughs> the school is called Drew School. Most most people call me Drew. So it just kind of works out that way. Um, but the head, head boys basketball coach here. And then I do a lot of uh, individual coaching and camps and clinics through Andrew Heath Basketball, which is my company on the side that I do uh, some coaching through. Wow. Wow. That's an amazing journey. Um, and it sounds like you're just getting, just getting started. There's a lot more, um, you know, to your journey to go. So that's, that's tremendous. Um, you, you mentioned China. How, how long were you in China? It sounds like you did two or three different things out there. You played, uh, you worked for the NBA out there as well. Yep. Did uh, camps with Yao Ming, uh, under Yao Ming. How, how long total were you out there? And, and uh, the second part to the question. Oh, go ahead. No, uh, I was out there for three years total from 2015 to 2018. 2015 to 2018. And, and what did you learn about the game of basketball or international basketball while, while you were out there? Because, you know, obviously it's most popular in the States, but many people don't know just how popular it is, you know, in, in a place like China. Yeah. Well. No, I think um, now I think we're seeing a lot of uh, like the world's coming, basically, right? Like a, a lot of the best players in the NBA are foreign players. Um, so I think at my time in 2015, kind of getting like a grasp of that or, or like getting insight on that. Um, so also during my time in China, a lot of my, my teammates and coworkers and other coaches were from a lot of the other European countries like Serbia, uh, France, had a bunch of guys from different African countries, um, Latin America. Um, so just seeing how wide the, the, the footprint and grasp of like the sport of basketball is, um, I don't think we'll ever, or I don't think the game of basketball will ever overtake soccer. Honestly, um, it, that's just a whole different beast and monster. But I do think it's turning into like a one A one B scenario where we're like right underneath it. Um, and then, in particular, for like basketball in China, they absolutely love the sport. Um, so from the grassroots level up to like their national team and like their their professional players. They love basketball. They they definitely love NBA basketball. They'll stay up late or wake up early to like 
watch the finals or, or see or see the big games. Um, and then there, that's also why I had the opportunity to, to work for some of the NBA academies. Um, the NBA is realizing that. So they're opening up academies in China, in Africa, in India um, to help to help spread the game. So, um, no, the, the, the world is definitely coming in terms of popularity and also like skill set, too. What was it like working for Yao Ming and how big is he in China? Because he was pretty big here when, when he had his stint with the Rockets out here. Yeah, no, um, he he's uh, like behind like Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant. He's probably like on that level for them out there. Um, had an opportunity to, to meet his wife and I actually coached his daughter at the time. Um, I think she might have been nine or, or ten years old. Um but she was already like five, eight, five, nine at like ten, right? Wow. Um, his, <laughs> his, his his wife is six six. Um wow. so just so just very big people, very large people. Um, but super nice guy. Um uh, and yeah, I do think um he was I wouldn't say he like obviously you had guys like Tony Kukoc and other guys before him, but I think at least for like the the uh, Asian market, it he he was a game changer for sure. Um, and even still to this day, I still think he's a, a bridge from connecting uh, Asian basketball market to the uh, states and the other parts of the world. Yeah, no, that's a, that's amazing. Um, so uh, just I guess my my quick statement on basketball. I just want your take on it. Uh, the, the the thing I love most about basketball is that you can bring, and this is different than most other sports. You can bring maybe one or two skills to the table. And you could be pretty competent in the game. You know, mm -hmm. you could be a rebounder and defender and still yeah. be a great asset to your team. You could be just a knockdown shooter and yeah. still be a great asset, um, you know, to the team. I, I think that's the difference versus other sports to where you kind of need, you know, in football, you kind of need core skills like speed and, and size and physicality or, or whatever. But in basketball, I feel like if you have one or two really good skills down, you can kind of uh, you know, just – I guess I'm asking, that's a statement, but I'm just asking what's your thoughts on that from the coaching and playing perspective? Um, yeah, no, I, I definitely think you're, you're hitting on the head. I do think at the higher levels, we're starting to see less and less of that. Um, but for like me right now, coaching at uh, the varsity level in high school, it's de you definitely can be a difference maker if you're just a really good rebounder or if you're just a really good defender, or if you are just a catch and shoot knockdown shooter. Um, and I do think traditionally there were guys in the NBA who were just like bruisers or I'm just locked down not, or they yeah, locked down defender or knockdown shooter. I do think we are starting to see, I felt like early 2000s, 90s, 80s, each team had a Patrick Beverly or like each team yeah. had like a Rudy Gobert where it's like, I'm just out here to get rebounds, block shots. And occasionally I'll get like a put back dunk or something. Um, yeah. But you don't see that. I think at least for like the higher levels, like the highest, highest level, it's like every guy on the court now can can shoot and dribble. And obviously they still have roles. So maybe this player gets to shoot more. Or this player gets to handle the ball more. But it used to be like, oh, like we know we can just sag off this guy and just let him shoot. Whereas, oh, no, like he may not shoot 15 times, but the six shots he takes, he can make four of them or five of them. Yeah. Um, but I do think – college and high school that's definitely still still very true where if you can just master one or two things you can be a, a varsity starter um we're like to your point i know for other sports where it's like oh you need to be fast quick strong have good mm -hmm. hands um so you yeah, know I, I do think basketball does have that unique trait to it yeah no very good point about the pro level because you're right got like you don't see a guy like dennis rodman anymore you know, where right. you know he might only score three points a game, but he's going to get 15 rebounds and he's going to be, you know, an all-star just doing yeah. that. You know, yeah. you don't you don't have that as, as much. Um, uh, I wanted to uh, ask you about um, just just coaching at the coaching at the high school level. How, how much because you can kind of see the future through the high school, you know, or through through that age group. Um, what are some of the things that you're seeing, you know, at, at the high school level that that uh, may, may have been different than, say, 10, 15 years ago um, when you were coaching and playing? Yeah, I think um, players are, are more skilled now, I think, across the board. And I do think uh, with social media, there's like uh, 
players are more skilled, but it's not like every single player is is better than they were 15, 20 years ago. Um, but I will say the average high school basketball player now has more in their package or, or skill set than when, when I was in high school or even 10 years ago. Um, but I do think, and I'm, at least at least in America, I don't think the game of basketball is being taught as much, um, which I think is starting to come back and you're starting to see more more social media clips, more coaches talk about how like we have to teach more of the game and teach more of, of, of the nuances, um, which I do think is a trickle down effect or we are seeing it why like some of the other countries are now more competitive with America and basketball. Um, I, I still think we're as a country, we're still producing the best talent, but I don't know if we're producing the best teams all the time. Um, if, if, if that makes sense. So I do think, yeah. um, Spain, France, uh, Argentina, um, Japan in the past couple of years, um, Australia. Um, mm-hmm. they, may not, they may not have a bunch of NBA guys on the roster, but they have a, a better team or guys that know how to maybe play better or know, or know how to play together better. Um, so I do see that at the youth level, high school level, where guys know the latest move, guys know how to score, but it's like, oh, I really, I really don't know how to like read a back door, or I really don't know how to like come off like a pin down screen, um, which is part of the reason why like high school coaches are supposed to teach the game. But I, <laughs> I do think coming into high school, I remember eighth grade going to ninth grade, or just the whole high school time period, there was just more of like an expectation of like you should know basic basketball lingo or terminology or or strategies. Where I'm starting to see just more kids don't know that stuff or we have to spend more time teaching some of the basic things that were just common knowledge, I think 15, 20 years ago. Yeah, no, great point. Great point with that. Um, yeah, this, the skill, you see this, some of the skills of the international players might be higher on average uh, than you see from, from uh, or, or athleticism from the American players might be higher on average. It right. kind, of, kind of balances out. Um, who, who are maybe two or three players that you see today in the NBA at the highest levels where you say, okay, this, this, this is the guy I want to show the tape to, to my high school athletes. This is the guy that I want, you know, my teenagers, high school players emulating skill wise, they play the game the right way. Um, who, who are like two or three guys that you see that, that today that they kind of emulate that? Yeah. Um, Got to give some of the international guys a shout out now that we're kind of talking about them. Um, Joker, Jokic, um his IQ is amazing and then from the aspect of like kind of like you were just saying he's not he can't jump the highest he can't run the fastest so how is he so effective when he isn't out jumping his defender he isn't like blowing by guys uh so I think that's a great person to watch um he, he does do some stuff that you just can't teach right like there are some of his shots he makes or other things where it's like that's just he's one of one in one sense um yeah. Nothing from that uh, vantage point. And then I, I personally love um, Devin Booker's game. I still love Kevin Durant's game where they're able to get to their spots with very little dribbles sometimes. So, yeah. and they play out of which I think is a lost art of like the, the mid range. Um, a lot of basketball is now, right? Shoot threes or, or get to the cup. If you can score in the mid range, that's still, that's still very effective, very important. Um, but also like how they get to those spots, how they get to the mid range. Um, I would point those guys out. The ones who I try to point out a lot also are Paul George and Kyrie Irving. But I actually like, I try to show clips when they're scoring, when they're not using all these amazing moves. I think Kyrie Irving might be one of the most talented and skilled players that's ever played basketball. And his highlights are amazing. I'm not going to like take that away. He'll make some crazy like reverse, like spin layups or like an eight combination dribble move. But if he, if he scores 40 points, those are only like eight to 10 points out of the 40. The other 30 are just very basic catch and shoot, pump fake one dribble. I'm going to get to the cup, make a left-hand layup. Um, so yes, he, he does have 10 points that are just like, wow, this is amazing. But the other 30 are the basic fundamental stuff. So I try to show that stuff where 
yes, you, you do need to be able to do those moves, but look at how efficiently he's scoring using very basic, very boring sometimes uh, tactics. Wow. Wow. No, that's great. Great insight with that. And uh, I, you mentioned the mid range game. Um, you know, when we grew up, Jordan, you know, even Kobe to a degree made a, made a living off of the elbow and, and mm-hmm. just scoring it in that area. Why, why do you think fewer and fewer players shoot from there anymore? It's, I mean, I've um, seen, I've seen like three on one breaks where a guy would pretty much everybody would run to the three point line or even the ball handler would stop and, and yeah. at the three point line. Uh, Analytics, I think, and I think that's the opposite trickle down effect. And I think before we're talking about like the trickle down effect from like high school leading up to the pros, I think now with analytics, where the message is if you shoot more threes, you'll score more points. So we'll take a three point shot over a two point shot. Um, yeah, and there, there have been some games um, where teams are, you know, two for 20 on threes and you see the coach keep shooting it, keep shooting it, keep shooting it. Um, so I think, I think that's part of it. I do think we are just going away from just sometimes take what the defense is, is giving you. So if the defense is giving you a mid range shot, shoot the mid range shot. Um, but I do think it started from analytics and most, most people watch NBA basketball. I don't think, I think people watch March Madness, like college basketball, and maybe if you have a local favorite team or if your dad's an alumni somewhere, maybe you watch the Florida State basketball game or, or whatever it may be. Uh, but most people are tuning in to watch Steph and Clay or to watch Dame Lillard or to watch Tyrese Halliburton. Um, so they are seeing these guys shuck up threes. Or to your point, they are seeing a three-on-one fast break. Oh, okay, well, I saw Dame Lillard run to the corner to shoot a three, so – why would I run to the basket to, to get a layup or a dunk? Um, so I, th- I think that's what's happening. And then, um, yeah, no, I, even now for the team I coach, they're, they're shooting way more threes than I definitely shot growing up. I think when I, when I was in high school and playing all that stuff, I was definitely a shooter. Maybe I would shoot six threes, and that was if I made two or three before. I wasn't just shooting yeah. six just because – Coach, let me shoot six. So, but even now, like I'll, I'll have guys on the team where I'm like, yeah, you know, like put up eight or nine. You know, it's yeah, it's, it's just the way the game's played, and I do think there are some benefits from it. But there are times where I'm like, like to your point, there are. I was actually talking about that yesterday with uh, one of the coaches on my staff. Of we got to get these guys to shoot layups on three on one breaks. Like we don't, we don't yeah. have one up from three. Like let's just get the easy two, and 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 capitalize on the uh, advantage. Yeah, yeah. Now we see that all the time, and I guess people don't remember Jordan won all those scoring titles. I mean, maybe right. he hit thirty threes in this, a whole season, maybe you know, yeah. like but he, he won all the scoring titles, you know, with the mid range and dunks and layups. Yeah. Um, uh, free free throw shooting, something that I'd love to get your perspective on because I, I never quite understood it. Uh, there are very few players that come into the league as bad free throw shooters and leave as good free throw shooters, or 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 the opposite, come in as good free throw shooters and leave as bad. Free- why, why is that something – like, why can't Shaq shoot free throws? No matter how hard he practices, you know, whatever. Is, is it a height leverage thing? Is it a – I mean, they don't – they've never moved the line back. The, the line has always been in the same area. And there's some guys like, a, say, a Mark Price that no matter – he probably could hit 93% of his free throws now. And there's guys like Shaq that might even, you know, when he was 21 or 41, he probably can hit two yeah. or three out of ten. Like, why – why is free throw shooting so difficult for some and just naturally easy for others? A lot of it is the uh, mental component. Um, some guys just approach it differently. Even when I'm doing my individual sessions, um, it's the only time in the game where no one's trying to block your shot, no one's distracting mm-hmm. you. Um, so I do know for some guys that it, it is just that mental switch. Or... Um, Oh yeah, I've seen I've seen shooters who shoot the same percentage across the board, and it's just like this is just so like they'll shoot forty five percent from the field, which is pretty good. They'll shoot forty five percent from three, which is very good. Really and good. Then they'll yeah. shoot like fifty five percent from the foul line. And it's like whoa, like, what's, what's what's going on here? Um, and it is just because of that, right? It's like oh, I'm a good shooter, but when you like take away the defender, when you take away me like running around for my shot. 
my brain, it just, it just views it differently. Um, I do know part of it specifically talking about like Shaq and like some of these other guys, sometimes their hands are so big that it actually makes it more difficult to like shoot the shot. Um, Mm -hmm. So I've heard some shooting coaches give the analogy of like, it's like trying to shoot like a tennis ball or like a grapefruit, right? Where it's like, you almost have too much control over the ball where you you don't have that touch to, to guide it in. Um, And then honestly, I I do know um, some, like I know Shaq famously is like, I, I make them in practice. I can make 20, 30 in a row. And, he would always say, well, I make it when it counts. You know, I, I yeah. might I might go 0 for 20 in, in the game. That means nothing. But in the game six of the championship game, I was seven for seven. Um, mm-hmm. But then it, it, it is just some guys just don't practice it. Right. So I, I do know um, not Shaq, but there have been some other players who've just come out and been like, well, if I'm averaging 20 and 10 and my foul shots aren't good. Well, I still average 20 and 10. So that's OK. Yeah. If I don't 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 have this part of the game. Um, but I, I do know a big part of it is just, uh, the, uh, mental component of just like being there, not having anyone bother you, um, and just getting into that like rhythm with it as well. Yeah. Now that makes sense. Cause I'm, I'm thinking now, even like I played a little bit of like just recreational ball as, as an adult and the, when you get fouled, you got to kind of calm your adrenaline down yeah. and kind of breathe. And then you know, bounce the ball, and so there, there's a bit like a you got to do it pretty quickly to, to to make those shots, and no one in your face and everything. I, I never thought about that. That's a, that's a good point. Yeah. That's, that's a really good point. Um, what are what are some of the hardest? We, we're speaking of free throw shooting. What, what are some of the hardest skills you think are to teach? Whether it's you know ball handling, left hand finishing at the cup, three point shooting. What 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 are some of the hardest skills that you feel are are you know the ones that are that are toughest to so yeah, still- I think it, it depends on the uh, the skill level and age. Um, I think if for for any player at any level, but I think definitely if you're starting out, but then you'll even see it college professional is any like weak hand skill. So if you're a lefty using your right hand, if you're righty using your left hand, um, whether that be finishing with, with with your off hand or weak hand or even passing, which I think um, a lot of times for like even some of my more like elite uh, athletes that I train, you can't always like pass the ball with two hands, right? There's a defender on your arm. So you have to be able to like dribble it and pass off that dribble. Can you do that with, with your off hand? If, if there's a defense, I'm a righty. If there's a defender on my right arm and I can't pick my right arm up to pass the ball, can I dribble it and make like an on time on, on spot pass just with my left hand? Um, mm. And then yeah, finishing too. And, to bring up uh, like Kyrie Irving again, I think he has an amazing left hand um, yeah. to where, and that just even makes it more difficult to guard. And I think if you, if more players as viewed it as that, if I can just literally do everything with my right, I can do with my left or vice versa. It just makes you that much harder to guard. Um, dribbling in the aspect of being able to dribble with like real action, real time defenders. So I think that's a, a skill set. I'm thinking more now from my coaching of my high school kids of you might look amazing in cones and you might be able to do all these things really fast and really quick. Once you put a defender on you, are you still able to do that stuff or can you still make that move through body contact? Um, and then I think getting the message across to the kids of, I think people think they're going to make a move and the defender is just going to completely like disappear. (laughs) No, you're going to, you're going to make your move and you're going to get an angle that's going to open up. You have to attack that angle or that gap. You're not like, you're not going to make a move. They're not going to fall down and you get this wide open (laughs) shot. That's not how it works. You're going to make a move and they're going to slightly like move one way or the other. And then can you attack that gap or opening? Um, and then I think lastly, shooting uh, contested shots. And I think that's even uh, mm-hmm. stuff you'll see at like the pro level where yeah. I think that's the difference between like sometimes all-stars or superstars or all-time greats where a lot, pretty much everyone in the NBA, if you're a guard or a forward can shoot, right? Okay, cool. If LeBron drives and he like collapses the defense, most of the time the guy he kicks it out to can like make the open shot. The next level is like, well, if that defender closes out on you, can you make the guy closing out? Okay, if you have to put the ball on the floor and 
make a pull up jump shot with the hand in your face. Can can you make those shots? Because um, same thing, we'll have workouts or or practices where wow, this guy's a knockdown shooter. Well, yeah, because no one's guarding him. But then the second yeah. there's a defender on him, the percentages dramatically decrease. Um, the thing I gave you a long answer. I think it was oh no, it's uh, good. Anything a- anything offhand or that shooting or passing, dribbling through um, real defenders and then being able to like shoot with um, uh, a, a defender on you. Cause I think the skills, and I think we were kind of talking offline or we were talking about just like, you can get better at these things like as you age or the more you do it. So yeah. whether you played in high school or not, or like you can develop a jump shot at 35, right? Like a, a bunch of the people yeah. I train are actually like businessmen or older people in their forties and fifties. I can get you a jump shot. Making yeah. the jump shot in the men's league is a totally different uh, conversation. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's great, great answer. And all, all those skills are, are, are tough to do. Um, yeah, for sure. I know for me personally, offhand, you know, struggle yeah. hard to, especially finishing with with the left. No way. Um, uh, yeah, shoot, shooting a contested shot that's that's hard as well. Something I learned. I forgot what defender taught me this, uh, but they taught me to block with my left hand because most shooters are righties and yeah. that improved my defense a lot i took that when i was like 18 or 19 i was like oh that makes sense because you can put your arm straight up yeah. versus kind of going across to try that's to block body. so when yeah. i learned i started blocking a lot of them shots but um but no that's 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 very good insight on that um the the euro step how, how would you explain that is it traveling is it not traveling i mean they don't really call it uh is that something you can teach or like it just it just kind of came out of nowhere in the last i don't know 10 years or so yeah. Um, explain that, especially to the audience that, you know, may not watch basketball. Regularly. Yeah. So I guess uh, if you're if you're brand new to it, it's like your traditional layup. Right. You take two steps like going forward. Right. So like one, two, then you jump off that second foot for the layup. The euro step is one of those steps is just like a lateral step. Right. So it'd be like one lateral step and then you jump off or sometimes like a lateral step first, then a forward step. You jump off of it. Um, so I think from that standpoint, it's it's not a travel. It's just you're using one of your steps to move a different direction. Um, gotcha. So instead of like two two uh, steps going forward, you have one step that goes sideways, then goes forward. I do think, as with most things in the NBA, there's always like a gray area for mm-hmm. what's a legal move, what isn't. Um, the whole gather step in the NBA of – you kind of get a gather step, then you get two steps. Um, <laughs> there's there's a rule if you if you take a dribble, you can kind of like float the basketball, right? So I can like oh, dribble, yeah. float. I can take like a few steps in between. But if yep. I dribble, put my hand on the ball. Oops, sorry about that. Hold on a sec. Let me get these lights oh, back. Good. There you go. Um, yep. If if you dribble and put my hand on the ball, then I then I only get two steps. Um, mm. So I think that also goes into the Euro of if I dribble, take a lateral step, but my hand, my other hand isn't on the ball, can I still take more steps or not? Two more steps, uh, yeah. So I, honestly, I think depending on what level you're coaching, who you're asking, what part of the world you're in, um, you're going to get different answers. But I think just the foundation of just like what a Euro step is, is it's not a travel. If you just do two steps and one of them happens to be like a, a lateral one, that's completely yep. within the rule book. Excellent. Now, that's the best explanation I've, I've heard on that because, you know, I, I've, I've just seen it in the NBA. So I feel like some players are taking liberties with it. I'm like, wait, that's that's two and a half or that's three steps, you know. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, OK, so if one step is lateral. That makes sense. Um, uh, last NBA question for, for me. Uh, how do you explain Luca's dominance? Because if, if I break it down, his game. He's one of the slowest players I've ever seen. <laughs> he's he's not an exceptional ball handler. You know, he's not crossing guys up. Uh, his shooting is great, but there are plenty of players in the league that, you know, average 10, 15 points a game just with that skill. Yeah. How is he so unstoppable, and how is he scoring 30 points a game with the skill set that uh, doesn't seem – with the physical skill set that doesn't seem to, to match a 30-point-a-game score? Yeah. Well, I think you, one of them you hit it on the head of, of just his shooting, right? So I do think um, 
there, there's been a lot of, especially since they made the fight, they're in the finals now. A lot of people are saying how Jason Kidd has been like mentoring him and Kyrie and how you can see like some of Jason Kidd's game and like both those guys now. Um, the difference between Jason and those two guys is Jason didn't have a jumper like yeah. Kyrie and Luke have. Um, yeah. So I do think that is like he does get at least 10 to 15 just off the fact that he can't shoot, right? He does have like a, a legit jump shot that he can't make off catch and shoot or off the dribble. Um, so that, that that is that right there. I don't think people realize how big he is. So he's mm-hmm. like six seven, six eight. 230-ish around there. Um, mm. So I think it creates like a, a, a matchup problem for some coaches where, okay, cool, you're not the quickest. So let me put like a smaller quick guy on you. He's like, oh, well, I'm 6'7", 6'8", 230, 240. I'm just going to like take my time and post you up. Okay, if I put a, a bigger guy on you, Luca isn't the fastest, but he might be faster than like another 6'8", six, 6'9", six, guy who just can't stay with them. Um and then his his basketball IQ and kind of what we were talking about earlier, his uh, passing ability. So he is one of those guys that can pass with his offhand and stuff. Um, so I do think he's able to keep the defense honest. So you can't you can't play him one way or shade him one way. So you have to play him straight up. If he draws two, he can kick it out. So then I think if if you're playing off of him, okay, let's double him or send help. He's able to make the good pass. If we don't double him, I think back to what we were saying earlier, it's not it's not the sexiest stuff. It's not the most highlight, but I'm just going to make a basic crossover, hit you with my shoulder, get a layup. <laughs> okay, you double yep. me, boom, I kick it out. Maybe you close on that guy, you pass it back to me. Because I can shoot now, I'm just going to catch this pass, knock down this three. All right, boom, I, I got six points in the first quarter. I do that four times each quarter. I got 24 points now. And maybe yeah. I had a good game where I'm hitting a few foul shots. Now I got 30 points. And so he doesn't yeah. – um, I think he, you have to watch the whole game to, like, get his, like, wow factor where I think, like, other young guys like Ant Edwards. It's like, yeah. oh, man, I saw, I saw 10 of his 30 points, and he had three poster dunks. He had this crazy fadeaway shot. Where earlier this year, Luca had, I think, like a 70 point game or a 75 point game. Yeah. Mo- most of those points yeah. were just, you know, I'm coming up <laughs> the wall, I'm knocking down a jump shot, I'm getting to the cup, laying it up. Um, yeah. So I think, I think that's the same thing with him and Joker. And I think that goes back to our earlier point of just like, they just see the game, right? They're, they're, they're just reading the spots, they're not doing anything too crazy. They're, they're just doing it at a, a high efficiency and, just capitalizing on other people's mistakes. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. It's a great, great point. And I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand this game. I, I, I just I'm trying to see the dominance in, I mean, I see the results in the dominance, but I'm trying to see how he gets his done. And guys are bouncing off him when he goes to the cup, you know, guys are kind of bouncing off him and he kind of gets his space for those, uh, those easy baskets. Um, what, what, what is like one or two changes you think will, will come at the highest level in the NBA? Like, like we're talking about things down the Euro step and, and the international element, things that weren't as prevalent, you know, 15 years ago. What, what are some of the future or one or two things you think is coming in the future to, to basketball that, that maybe we don't see as prevalent now? Uh, I think the first, at least for the NBA, may not be like a, a rule change, but I do think they're going to – do something to make the all-star game more competitive. Um, yeah. yeah. I think the other aspect for the NBA, it is, it is entertainment. It is a form of entertainment. I know a lot of times they look and market the brand of basketball as, as this entertainment platform. Um, and the all-star weekend is a huge selling point, a big way they make money during the season. So I do think they're going to figure out some way to like restructure that or make it more competitive. Um, just because the past couple of years, it's just been like kind of like a, a, a snooze fest to watch. Um, so with that, um, I do think they're going to. This was a, a, a debate I would always get into, like with um, some of my like European uh, co-workers and former co-workers of what NBA player would dominate or do well in like the Euro League and which NBA player would struggle just from the different defensive rules. Um, so there's no kind of like what we we're talking about earlier with like Jordan, there was hand checking in the nineties and early two thousands, 
you can't hand check now. You can't really like put your hands on offensive players as a defender. Um, I don't think they'll ever go back to like maybe the way the nineties were played, but I do think there's some middle ground of they have to let the de- defenders be a little more physical and take away from like some of the flapping that the offensive players are doing. And then I think that also has a trickle down effect of like the three point shooting and like having less three point shots go up. Cause from the NBA's perspective, higher scoring games attracts more fans, sells more tickets, mm-hmm. does more stuff like that. So why do we want to like the other argument when Jordan was winning or some of these like Detroit Pistons games, like the final score would be like 75 to 85. Yeah. Yeah. Where there there are some halftime scores where it's like <laughs> 70 to 65. Um, yeah. But I, I do think they're starting to find some middle ground of like, we can't just let the guys run up and down and shoot threes because it's just starting to take away from some of the beauty of the game or how the game should be played. Um, so I think those two things, the all-star game will be reconstructed somehow, some way. And then I think they'll start maybe not like big rule changes, but they'll start letting defenders play more physical or um, just be able to defend the offensive players a little more aggressively. Yeah, I'd, I'd actually like to see that. I'd definitely like yeah. to see a little, a little more defense involved. Um, and I think that'll improve the regular season too, because then defenders, you know, can can play harder. You know, they can play harder. Um, and Andrew, where where can people find your, your you know your business, your websites, uh, you know, your, your coaching clinics, um, your social channels? Just kind of give us the rundown where where people can find you. Yeah, uh, my my website is andrewheathbasketball.com. Um, and same thing for, uh, Instagram, uh, at Andrew Heath basketball. Um, and yeah, that's, that's where you can find everything I'm, I'm doing. Uh, I have some stuff coming up this summer, uh, hosting some academies from France and uh, some few players from China coming out to, to, to train with me this summer. So excited for it. Um, and then, yeah, if if anyone listening is ever in in the Bay area, the out in a Cali, you could definitely hit me up always down to get in the gym and do some sessions. That's awesome. Definitely connect with Andrew Heath. Great basketball of mine uh, and, and a lot of knowledge and, and can help your game. Uh, Andrew, thanks again for, for joining the Depths on Air. Really appreciate the time and, and all the basketball knowledge. Appreciate it, man. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Adeptus on Air. If you like this episode, please subscribe and leave a review. If you have a question related to this episode or have a request for what you would like to hear, please email us at marketing at adeptuscpas.com. You can also find us at adeptuscpas.com online or follow us at Adeptus on social media. The views and opinions by the podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Adeptus. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice.